like to invite Professor Zeynep Direk to the stage. Um, she's a pioneer in the Turkish scene of philosophy, and I, I, I think she, yes, I will just give her the stage and, and, and um, yes, um, I hope you will enjoy our presentation. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I am truly honored uh, to be here today with you to give a talk on uh, Simon de Beauvoir's notion of ambiguity in his uh, existentialist, in her existentialist ethics. Okay, uh, my my talk is a little bit uh, long, but I'm going to. Uh, shorten it if uh, I exceed my time. Uh, I wanted to give you the philosophical context, and it is a little bit exegetical as well, especially uh, I wanted to uh, make clear Simone de Beauvoir's response to Albert Camus in The Ethics of Ambiguity. Uh, so my thesis is that uh, Simone de Beauvoir describes her ethics of freedom as the term as transcending individual interests. For her ethics requires a commitment to support others in their experience of uh, freedom in their attempt to liberate themselves from uh, particular situations of oppression. The intern subjective nature of ethical and political situation makes it ambiguous and transcendence becomes even harder if you consider the subject and the act as caught up in irreducible ambiguity. I will, consider, uh, I, I will concentrate on the ontological entanglement of the lived experience of oppression and try to explain why Beauvoir resists reducing ambiguity in the sense of the situation, even when the situation needs to be resolved by prioritizing some values and reasons over others. Let us begin by noting that Simone de Beauvoir considers ambiguity in ethics of ambiguity in the context of a discussion about authenticity and inauthenticity. Authenticity concerns the question who the subject is, whether or not the subject chooses, takes up the possibilities that are her own most possibilities. That requires that the subject is able to distinguish between an inauthentic being with and an authentic being with the others. Of course, that's possible only if we are not separate, isolated, solipsist subjects to begin with. As in phenomenology, in existentialism too, being with others belongs to our being. Moreover, with the recognition of our embodied nature, this being with gets taught as communication. In Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception in 1945, and as entanglement, entrelacement, in the uh, visible and the invisible, published in 1961. It is well known that Beauvoir's existentialist ethics rests on embodied subjectivity in a situation, and it makes use of the terms such as intentionality, meet sign, being with, transcendence, authenticity, and bad fate, fault and the irrelevance of fault, freedom and obligation, 
conversion and nothingness. She is seen as offering a humanist philosophical anthropology, even though underlying it, we can uncover a phenomenological ontology. Remarkably, her work is heterogeneous and stands at the crossroads of various sometimes conflicting conceptual, conceptual intersections of various philosophical influences, Hegel, Heidegger, Husserl, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, Camus, and others. Nonetheless, the letting in of these influences to engage with them is also at the same time a seeking of her own voice and argument in an intersubjective uh, plane of thinking. One outcome of that has been the difficulty of extrapolating and singling out Beauvoir's own voice from the voices uh, she engages as her interlocutors while reflecting. Especially in so far as ambiguity is concerned, is it only political, historical, or an ontological and moral predicament of human existence? This question is philosophically uh, central. The notion of ambiguity is central to Merleau-Ponty's thought. Rejecting dualism, he saw the relationship between the subject and the object, the intelligible and the sensible, the soul and the body, to be profoundly ambiguous. Indeed, he writes, I quote, all life is undeniably ambiguous, and there is never any way to know the true meaning of what we can do. End of quote. Etymologically speaking, ambiguity comes from ambigere, to waver, to go around. It has the sense of uncertainty, instability, and the lack of determination. Man and adversity could be characterized as a study of what can possibly go wrong, given the twofold nature of human existence, given the tensions in human existence. In other words, it concerns the scenarios where this existential wavering produces tragic results. Merleau-Ponty begins the essay by pointing out that the 20th century has forced into crisis our understanding of a human being. The view of the unified, even identifiable human nature is no longer tenable. The century in question witnessed a truly remar remarkable diversity of standpoints and behaviors. People espoused idealism or materialism, communism or mercantilism. They, they waged wars and created outstanding literary works. In this way, we saw the human being oscillating between blind aggression and noble aspirations, between chaos and clear ideas. What are we to make of this capacity of the human to go in opposite directions? Indeed, how to make the knowledge or understanding of human being adequate to his capacities? Bauer's novels and autobiographical works have been very popular in her lifetime, but according to commentators who try to read her as a philosopher, they weren't transformative of the conventions of these genres of literature. Nonetheless, it is undeniable that she has made a revolution in her own time as a woman talking about her lived uh, experience as sexed. The, the, she wrote three other philosophical works, uh, Pyrrhus and Sinaeus in 1944, Existentialism et la sagesse des nations, uh, Existentialism and the Wisdom of Nations in 1948, and Privileges in 1955. In addition to her well-known book, Ethics of Ambiguity, published in 1947, these early publications demonstrate her clear theoretical concerns. However, her intellectual innovation is most evident in her, in her Second Sex, published in 1949, 
and the old age, sometimes translated as the coming of age, published in 1970. These works exhibit a distinct style and methodology for analyzing the contradictory development of marginalized individuals, such as women, non-whites, and the elderly, who exist as embodied, embodied, embodied subjectivities, even in societies that claim to provide legal or other forms of institutional social equality. These works present a web of ethical concepts in taking up various ethical issues, though often some of these concepts tacitly contest each other. The most striking tension is perhaps between the value of autonomy and intersubjectivity. The second sex and coming of age have been interpreted in the context of the earlier works. Commentators have sought to draw ethical concepts from these early works, such as the invention of values and the capacity to enhance the freedom of the other to shed light on these most original works. The strategy of reading is useful when it does not neglect that Beauvoir's thought undergoes transformations that deserve the name conversions. As Penelope Deutscher remarks, I quote, Pyrrhus and Sinus and Ethics of Ambiguity are simpler works than the second sex and the old age, with fewer layers of enmeshed concepts. Nonetheless, they bear witness to Beauvoir's willingness to allow a cohabitation of ideas that may be inconsistent, end of quote. It may be difficult to see how these inconsistencies and incongruent perspectives may be reconciled, and sometimes they may not dialectically resolve in a unity at all. For instance, Pyrrhus and Cineas takes the subjects in its ontological freedom, as I quote, free to transcend all transcendence, end of quote. The other's freedom is as total as mine, therefore transcending the other's freedom does not annulate it. She writes, I quote, the other's freedom is total because the situation is only to be surpassed and freedom is equal in every surpassing, end of quote. However, the work also stresses my capacity to further the other's freedom and makes a case for my dependence on another's freedom. If Beauvoir agrees, I quote, we give up taking the other for a freedom, we restrict accordingly the possibilities of expanding our being, end of quote. However, can my freedom both be total and dependent on others' freedom. A way to reconcile that is to argue that the subject can be maximally free only if it's entang only in its entanglement with others. Similarly, even though, as George Lukács observed, ethics of ambiguity appeals to ontological freedom as a fundamental fact about our being that can neither be augmented nor lessened, Beauvoir also appeals to freedom as a matter of historical development. Keeping track of the terms reciprocity, repetition, the other, authenticity, bad faith, generosity, ambiguity, ethics, we can unveil the moments of conversion in Beauvoir's ethical thought. From a hermeneutical point of view, they play the role of change terms or transformational terms in her text. They can also be considered as values in Beauvoir's work, with all the consequent problems of how Beauvoir justifies a cluster of values that she introduces. One must keep in view the specific contexts in which such justifications are attempted to they may be better understood as intersecting in a theoretical constellation of concepts, which intersect and as configurations are modulated in different works as her thought undergoes 
a conversion. Thus, to take one of the most flexible terms in Beauvoir's lexicon, reciprocity, is as a consistent value throughout her work from an eye for an eye onward, we discover that the meaning of reciprocity is multiple, taking on over uh, more than 10 meanings. One of the concepts of ethics discussed in Ethics of Ambiguity relates to one of several uh, of her definitions of authenticity. It will involve our unwillingness to, I quote, recognize any foreign absolute. End of quote. We would understand that it is not a matter of being right in the eyes of God, but of being right in one's own eyes. End of quote. Renounce, renouncing the thought of seeking the guarantee for one's existence also outside of oneself, one will also refuse to believe in unconditioned values, which would set themselves up to toward one's freedom like a thing. What she describes here is concretized in her later interpretation of Saad, whom she presents as refusing to recognize a foreign absolute, being willing to act in free defiance of contemporary morality, religion, and law. She regards Saad as undergoing something like a stoic conversion Though in both ethics of ambiguity, in Pierce and Cineas, Govar had also distanced herself from what she taught as a stoic form of conversion. A stoic conversion happens by acknowledging and accepting circumstances that are outside our control to cultivate a sense of personal inward freedom. If an individual is unable to alter the state of the world, they should instead focus on transforming themselves to maintain inner peace in the midst of worldly adversity. Indeed, Saad did not prioritize personal transformation, as his goal was to revolutionize the society by eliminating oppressive legislation. His adherence to a natural way of life involved challenging the ethical principles of human society through the act of imitating nature. Beauvoir does not only take as inauthentic the attitude of submission to the absolute in the form of God or social morality, she also refuses ethics based on unconditioned principles. Her ethics is contextual, situational, and pays attention to human relationality in existential embodiment. Every situation requires a new evaluation of all the values relevant in that context. If authenticity has to do with making a free decision by re-evaluating the particular situation and its salient features, what does that evaluation have anything to do with ambiguity? Now, in my, I'm in the second part of my paper uh, where I take up Beauvoir's text as uh, she engages with Camus' uh, work in the myth of Sisyphus. In Ethics of Ambiguity, Beauvoir explores the ethical implications of Sartre's existentialism, of existentialism in general. This is the philosophical context, but the book has a political context as well. It is written in the aftermath of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, in an atmosphere in which arguments concerning the possibility of revol revolutionary violence and the violence of resistance are prominent in the French left. This also bears the memory of occupation and resistance, uh, the revelations of the Soviet regime and the emergence of the anti-colonial struggles. It's a text that is roughly contemporary with Merleau-Ponty's humanism and terror and anticipates later reflections on violence in the interaction between Sartre and Franz Fanon. 
In this text, Beauvoir takes up the problem of oppression and reflects on the legitimacy of political violence from an existentialist and syndicalist perspectives. The first part of the text investigates and evaluates various responses to the human condition. The second part concentrates on the question about the use of violence in political action against oppression. In the first part, the human condition is characterized by freedom and transcendence, which is a dimension of the being of the human being that enables this being to overcome the situation in which it finds itself. The existentialist perspective affirms the impossibility of identifying human existence with any given essence. Making choices is fundamental to human being in the world. Choices in, is intimately connected with the notion of project because to choose means that the agent assumes some possibilities rather than others to launch them to the future. Ethics is embedded in the necessity of choice. However, people's projects may clash as an outcome uh, as an and as an outcome, the world may take a zero sum form. Life is structured in agonistic terms, but it is also possible to support others generously in their projects that will be beneficent, which is not a strict duty in Kant, though in situations in which the other is conceived as subject to oppression, there is an ethical responsibility, according to Beauvoir, to struggle alongside them toward liberation. Against Camus' characterization of existence as absurd, which does not allow for hope, Beauvoir plays out her notion of ambiguity of existence. In his work, The Myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus explores the profound philosophical inquiry of whether life devoid of meaning is unworthy of living and thus justifies suicide. This question holds significant weight as individuals are willing to sacrifice their lives in the face of answers they find for the existential questions they ask. Existential questions are quite unlike other philosophical inquiries that may be perceived as mere intellectual pursuits. Camus characterized existence as absurd because it does not get its meaning from the absolute and does not have a meaning in itself. Existence is totally contingent without a unified meaning, a telos, but then can't we give meaning to it? This tentative will be in vain because existence is not what we want or decide it to be. It towards our projections. It has an alterity that we cannot master. Uh, just as John Lennon says, life is what happens to you, what you undergo while you make plans. <laughs> there can po be possibilities that we have not seen or anticipated. Reality is thick, a swirl of virtual structures, emergent possibilities and meanings. It is naive to believe that things appear as we project them or wish them to appear. We are not the only source of their meaning. Indeed, Camus can be read as denying intentionality in the Husserlian sense, the existence of an a priori correlation between us and the world of appearances and essences. Consciousness is not the source of meaning, and the world without a consciousness is meaningless. Camus maintains that the cosmos is neutral in the face of the human desire for meaning. Philosophical systems such as Hegel's and Marx's, on the other hand, gives us a flip side of that. They postulate a systematic account of the universe. Camus holds that if the universe has no meaning in itself, small human affairs in the world can't have any meaning either. He views suicide as an admission that one is unable to endure the burdensome and purposeless nature of life. We cannot transform the world into a familiar and comprehensible place for ourselves because we lack understanding. 
the subject is condemned to be an outsider in the world. He asserts that individuals can escape from the sense of absurdity, which he refers to as the act of eluding by relying on religious or ideological commitments that provide them with hope. However, he contends that the lack of significance in life, the lack of meaning in life, does not automatically make it unworthy of being lived. In discussing the reasons behind his rejection of the irrational, he presents a number of insoluble contradictions. These include the conflict between people's desires to discover an absolute, coherent unity in the world and the fragmented, diverse reality that actually exists. Another paradox is the tension between the certainty of descriptive data and the uncertainty surrounding their explanations. The stranger, according to him, is a person who does not attempt to familiarize the world by explaining it through comprehension, but rather chooses to live in it. Camus argues that the experience of absurdity arises when individuals who are seeking a purposeful meaning in their life come face to face with a senseless and irrational universe. Absurdity is the characteristic of the individual's existence in a purposeless society. He elucidates the concept of absurdity, which is based on the perception that individuals have excessively high expectations of the world and what the world has to offer. Camus presupposes that truly resolving a problem necessitates addressing all its aspects without eliminating any. He proceeds to critique existentialist philosophers such as Chestov, Jaspers, and Kierkegaard, accusing them for committing a philosophical suicide because they seek something beyond reason once they recognize the limitations of reason. In this manner, he asserts that paradoxically, they discover logical justifications for the world in their perspective, lacking any guiding principles. Alternatively, he suggests embracing the sensation of absurdity by acknowledging the limitations of reason without attempting to surpass those boundaries. He accepts Husserl's phenomenological approach, which focuses on describing rather than explaining with certain variations. His proposition entails restricting one's existence solely to what one is familiar with, while striving to live a life without appeal. A metaphor indicating the absence of any higher standard or criterion that can determine the values and thus eliminate the futility of one's life. Furthermore, it implies, uh, it implies the absence of any prospect of discovering a purpose or significance in this way of living. Therefore, the absurd is constantly present and we cannot escape absurdity and choosing not to avoid it, we come to the revolting consciousness, which Camus views as a suitable approach to existence. In, the, in his view, revolt gives life meaning. Therefore, taking one's own life or engaging in a philosophical mindset that rejects the absurd and ends in rebellion is not the correct course of action. Stranger's perspective aligns with the notion that freedom of others is not a matter of concern for him. However, while discussing his own freedom, he maintains that true freedom can only be achieved by embracing the ludicrous and not seeking refuge in a transcendent, uh, transcendent ideal like God. 
we will analyze a significant dist distinction between Beauvoir and Camus uh, by pointing uh, her presentation of the concept of uh, ambiguity as an alternative to Camus' reading of absurdity. Uh, Camus explains why the absence of meaning does not diminish the value of life. He argues that the absurd, which paves the way for freedom and passionate revolt, cannot be a justification for suicide, whether it is based on biological or philosophical reasons. Instead, the absurdity of life actually gives it value. However, a universally applicable set of ethical values is unavailable. Consequently, the author argues that individuals can devise their own ethical values when the significance lies in the abundance of experiences coupled with a revolting uh, attitude. Consequently, it becomes evident that Sisyphus ought not to be envisioned as um, discontent, although he lacks any expectation of achieving a goal. He serves as a representation of those individuals who see the futility of their existence, yet persist in living it with fervent defiance. In her Ethics of Ambiguity, Beauvoir addresses various criticisms of existentialism and her comments can be interpreted in light of Camus' position on meaning, freedom, and action. Beauvoir characterizes existential philosophy as a philosophy that requires uh, the recognition of the inherent ambiguity of human existence. It is also seen as a philosophy that explores the themes of absurdity and des despair, ultimately leading individuals to a state of empty subjectivity. She rejects the criticisms of existential philosophy that label it as solipsistic and formalistic. According to her, the absence of a direct appeal to life means that one cannot justify one's actions based on values or principles that exist independently of persons. Beauvoir associates violence with the spirit of seriousness because here we have a persona who identifies with some ends and values, and this persona takes them as absolute and eliminates vagueness and ambiguity so that he refuses to see the situation from a different angle. As a result, the serious man can treat others as hindrance or obstacle to eliminate. Others can appear to him as creating problems before his projects. Even though the serious man may engage with the world productively, he's a dangerous character. Because the serious persona takes his own projects, values, and principles as absolute, and uh, see the human life as instrumental, reduce people to being mere means, and fail to value their lives. Indeed, the serious persona never questions or modifies his hierarchy of values. He is not necessarily a tyrant, but he can turn into one, refusing to respect the freedom of others. Reducing people to mere means and not valuing their freedom gives us a description of oppression from an ethical uh, standpoint. Rather, she suggests that, Spohar suggests that, such justification can only be achieved through reasons that arise from one's existence. The absence of an appeal recurs in Camus' work, distinguishing his findings from those of Beauvoir. She believes that the best approach to life is not to attempt to remove the unavoidable an unavoidable, avoidable, inevitable ambiguity of life, but rather to embrace and live in harmony with ambiguity, which can be achieved by not regarding any value, desire, or passion as absolute, 
and by maintaining a certain level of detachment from oneself through continuous reflection on one's aims and values. This necessitates not making the mistake of regarding anything as an immutable standard of value. She refers to the cultivation of that awareness as existential conversion, which is accompanied by the affirmation of human existence as the source of values. Values serve as a basis for individuals to assess their activities, which make an impact on the world and for which the agent, agents are accountable. She takes the unjustifiability of life to imply that there's no value independent of life that can validate life. Consequently, there are no universally accepted values to assess ways of living. The source of values lies in singular human beings with var varying objectives whose subjectivities are unavoidable and real. The individual consciousnesses desire personal autonomy. People want themselves to be free, as stated by Sartre, insofar as they stri strive to disclose their being in the world. Desire is underpinned by lack, motivating a manifestation of freedom in the world. The claim that freedom is the origin of all significance and value challenges the notion of a purposeless existence and thus imbues it with meaning by assessing the lives shaped by the purposeful acts individuals undertake in the pursuit of their goals. Therefore, the human world emerges brimming with profound meanings. Thus, life can be justified subsequently without any reliance on external values that exist independently of human existence. Hence, even though Camus and Bauer share the belief that existence cannot be justified based on universal principles, Camus did not believe in the possibility of finding meaning in life, there are various Beauvoir points to the ambiguity of meaning. Camus, con uh, Camus conceives human survival as caught up in a repetition. All we can do is to live like Sisyphus. His life is hard, though he cannot be said to be unhappy, pushing the rock up the hill. It could be that this rock is our engagements in the world, but also our own corporeal existence as it traverses the cycle of everyday occupations and dealings necessary to live. Camus describes absurdity as something that re-engages me with the life of the other. Facing the absurd puts me in touch again with the bizarre overdetermination of pain and shame. Beauvoir asserts that the potential for failure should not hinder freedom, and rather than retreating in the face of barriers, achieving freedom necessitates taking action despite the possibility of cert or certainty of failure. Here, Sisyphus may be commemorated, and similar to Camus, she would assess uh, his condition not as sad, as she believes that the value of activity lies not in its achievements, but rather in the exercise of freedom, which will be the ultimate purpose of human existence. Beauvoir perceives revolt, uh, which is a fundamental idea for Camus, as without any inherent positivity. Consequently, she argues that it should transform into struggle and revolution by acquiring substance, by active engagement. For her, a heightened awareness of ambiguity should not stop the agent from engaging with the other's oppression. If this is unattainable, she perceives suicide as a deliberate act of self-termination and a means to reject the circumstances that have been placed, uh, imposed upon the agent. This marks a divergence from Camus. She opposes a stoic conception of freedom as an abstract idea and does not believe in surrendering to uncontrollable causes. Instead, she views suicide as an expression of personal freedom. In contrast, Camus views the concept of revolt 
as not being inadequate, and he does not consider suicide as a viable solution because it will only confirm the absurd expressed earlier, so negating both freedom and the act of rebellion. It is important to acknowledge that Camus con condemns a certain type of suicide, namely the act of taking one's own life in response to the absurdity of existence. Beauvoir would also condemn this type of suicide. Her framing of suicide as a final option when freedom is unattainable might be interpreted in connection with her view of freedom as the ultimate goal of human existence. Camus diverges from Beauvoir in his belief that freedom does not necessitate a moral existence. Consequently, he would not endorse suicide even within the framework proposed by Beauvoir. Now, the figure of adventure is perhaps as important as the figure of the serious man, and Beauvoir rejects both personas, types, in order to describe what it means to be truly free in the moral sense. The adventurer, characterized by a vibrant vitality and a penchant for introspection, does not place much importance on politics. However, it is possible that the adventurer may have hidden motives, and there's a risk that their love for adventure may be seen as absolute, similar to how serious individuals view others as mere objects, disregarding their freedom in, in the pursuit of supposedly unconditioned universal values they uphold. She asserts that the key difference between a free individual and an adventurer is that the former values the freedom of others while the latter regards others as mere things to be manipulated and can thus become a tyrant. The adventurer, while exercising their freedom in action, is closer to being free than, than the serious persona. However, without the presence of others, the adventurer becomes enslaved to his own goals. Rather than desiring the liberation of others, their primary focus is in their own accumulation of riches and influence. This leads them to defend the current oppressive regimes and their authority, ultimately resulting in their own subjugation to the very forces they seek to safeguard. This can be interpreted as a critique of Camus' individualistic perspective on freedom and revolt. He critiques the serious man's approach by labeling extreme ideological and religious convictions, uh, part, sorry, she critiques, uh, Beauvoir critiques, the serious man's approach by labeling extreme ideological and religious convictions as e escapism. Uh, the serious man uh, reduces others, uh, can reduce the others to being mere means, can approach them in an instrumental manner, and the adventurer fails to see the importance of considering the freedom of us, others as a necessary aspect of a revolting attitude. And as a result, he does not recognize uh, the issues uh, that um, entanglement uh, manifests. Both individuals do not believe in the existence of transcendental justification or a predetermined meaning of life. They also do not see any possibility of salvation. However, Beauvoir arg argues that the true freedom can only be realized through social interactions with others, where the freedom of all individuals is valued and supported. Camus does not explicitly express a lack of concern for the freedom of others, but he does not provide further details on this matter. Uh, clearly, he doesn't take a supportive uh, attitude either. It appears that he acknowledges the potential for individual freedom within a collective, but does not actively promote or support uh, the freedom of others. 
Beauvoir believes that safeguarding the freedom of others can shield us from succumbing to the trap of absurdity in two distinct ways. While it is undeniable that there's no inherent uh, meaning to life from a transcendental perspective, humans cope with this absurdity by providing explanations for life through their own existence. The meaningful context of freedom is the act of caring for the freedom of others. Freedom is achieved through moral choices and the moral context involves compromising interests and the potential for both losses and rewards. Another way in which caring for others, uh, freedom protects us is by recognizing that the coexistence of diverse individuals with different goals serves as a foundation for establishing shared moral uh, values and rules. This collective existence allows for the development of a common language, which in turn provides a meaningful context for values and meanings that were previously lacking. The only way to share values and meanings is by having the appropriate context with uh, individuals who have their own experiences, resonating experiences of uh, their own situations, who are without being const constrained uh, by, um, by by determining uh, for determining the situation from an external point of view. One's concerns for others indirectly justifies one's own existence. This can be achieved by applying the values uh, discovered in ethics, uh, which is attentive to ambiguity. Existential ethics is neither solipsistic nor formalistic. Uh, Camus does not believe that we should adopt a goal to support freedom of others uh, and, and make it a, an ultimate uh, objective in the moral sense. Consequently, he does not consider mutual recognition and respect for others as a necessary precept. He believes that aspiring for it is not compatible with the revolting attitude, and he also highlights the insignificance of the topic of others, other people's freedom by alluding to the strange, stranger's attitude, which involves abstaining from attempting to understand unclear things. Uh, freedom of others is included in that. Therefore, Beauvoir criticizes Camus' self-interested focus on his own freedom and disregard for the freedom of others in an abstract manner, as, as um, I tried to uh, explain previously. Uh, but here we see a, a intense engagement uh, with Camus and in the last analysis, uh, Beauvoir uh, highlights uh, this desire to will oneself free, desire to be free, and desire to be moral, willing oneself moral. Now I want to go to uh, the last part of uh, my uh, uh, talk. Uh, where I take an ontological perspective, because uh, the second part was exegetical a little bit, uh, but I want to see uh, also the ontological uh, plane uh, underpinning Boer's uh, interpretation of social and political context and the philosophical uh, exchange with Camus. Opposing Camus, uh, and the philosophical systems, Beauvoir proposes a new theory of the meaning of human existence. Ontologically, she regards the totality of existence as dynamic, open-ended, a plane in which meaning emerges, accumulates, sediments, and can be historically constituted, modified, with displacements, inter intensifications, constructions, deconstructions and reconstructions. But how is that possible? First of all, it is remarkable that, uh, though that's not sufficiently emphasized in the philosophical literature on Beauvoir, 
Beauvoir does not take an intellectualist approach to reality at all. Lived experience is underpinned by understanding. However, that understanding is transactional. It is based on communication with that which is understood. In other words, the mind gives back to the thing that which it took from it in the first place. And that's also a motif uh, that appears in Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception. And what is that taking if it is not something, uh, some kind of entanglement through sensory and motor skills? Our bodies enable us to access to the perceptual world. Though we do not reach out to our own body, and we do not achieve access to it, we cannot completely objectify our own body, uh, but in, in, it enables us to uh, have a perceptual access uh, to the world. We don't have to acquire conceptual or sensory moral skills to be aware of what we feel. The body is there as an animal inheritance, independently of what we know, what we do, what we judge. But it makes possible for us to, all, to do all these things. There is an opacity of the body in that it makes that which we encounter appear. Through it, uh, though it continues to remain in the background. In case we desire to bring it, bring, bring this pervasive feature of our lives into focus, we need actively to, to withdraw from our habitual engagement with the world around us. Phenomenology uh, focuses on terms such as presence and absence, and it is important that in uh, existentialist phenomenologist, presence comes with absences. My sense of the take, let's take an example, and this is coming from Husserl. My sense of the visual presence of, let's say, a tom tomato comes with the absence of uh, some of the aspects it does not present to me, such as the backside. In contrast, say, uh, the, the, the tomato's inside might not be present to me uh, either when I'm having a, a visual access to it. Um, now, I have the practical understanding and simple movements of my hand and body in relation to the thing, which makes it manifest itself to me. It makes it possible uh, for me to experience it. So movement is uh, central, uh, and absence is part of the uh, presence of the thing. Uh, it's always, there though too makes that point when he reads uh, Husserl. Uh, right? Presence is never platitudinous, uh, full. There's no such thing as full uh, presence. Presence is uh, enmeshed or interwoven with uh, absences. The object is present to me now because I understand and I have a distinctive visual style of accessing to it. In fact, there's a double access uh, to uh, anything given in perception. We access it both by understanding and through our senses um, in our perceiving body. Um, and, and access uh, is made possible by movements. And furthermore, in phenomenology, you have the idea that uh, practical understanding, which enables us uh, access uh, to the thing, uh, tells us what the thing is, is also based on uh, sensory motor movements. The body presents what it encounters through perception only because the perceived is there. Uh, we can perceive something uh, there only when it is there. Beauvoir, like Sartre, is a direct realist. We manifest a being not because we stand in a relational proximity to it, but when it is available to us. That can be understanding, conceptual knowledge, 
which is in phenomenology grounded on sensory motor skills and practical forms of knowledge, which makes the invisible, the absent in the perceptual sense present and available to the mind. In this sense, we have a double access to the perceived through sensory motor skills and understanding at once. Perceptual consciousness is a special style of access to the world, but access is not something bare, root, or found. The ground of access is our possession of knowledge, understanding, and skills. Without understanding, there is no access and so no perception. My emphasis here is on a special kind of understanding, though, that distinctively underwrites our perceptual access to objects and properties, namely sensory motor understanding. We can see uh, what there is, when it is there, and what makes it the case that it is there is the fact that we comprehend its sensory motor significance. Sensory motor understanding brings the world into focus for per perceptual consciousness. Our uncovering of being true understanding has a similar singular style. It feeds from our previous encounters with people, ideas, our experiences. This is part of our singular existence, our singular style is embodied we have sensory motor skills, which enables us to encounter other singular bodies. These skills enable us to perceive and understand these beings in their alterities, in their specific ways of being, in their styles. And because absence is part of presenting, things and people can only be present to us in their absences. This introduces an ontological ambiguity and perhaps an inexhaustible one. We cannot exhaustively uncover singular beings in what they are. Alterity may outstrip our powers to possess beings. Acting in the context of ambiguity must not get its justification from a totalizing universalist theory, a rationalist kind of necessity. The assessment of the situation is nonetheless made through a definitive judgment about, about although um, a definite judgment about it is infinitely postponed. In other words, final judgment can never be made, so it is always to come. The finite future holds in its reserve a different horizon in which things are disclosed under different lights. This is part of the general truth that things become present to us as involving absences. With the movements of my eyes and my hand, I disclose the perceptual thing, the tomato. My tongue has a different style of disclosing its singularity. We also encounter other human beings because we are embodied. And this is our way of access to them, the presence of a thing or of another human being is not given to us, it is something we win. This incompleteness of the givenness can be the thrill and the joy of the unpredictable, but it can also be a source of fear and anxiety. There is the unexpected, the unpredictable, unseen, invisible, thus winning a presence is like being familiar with a style. It is always partial, gradual, has degrees, and never means a complete possession. Furthermore, it has a double structure. In this structure, we are interwoven with it, and it becomes independent from us. Beauvoir highlights that as follows. Okay, uh, the rejection, uh, of the submission to the absolute involves an acknowledgement of singularity. Beauvoir is a thinker of singularity because in uh, having an access, in disclosing the world as embodied subjects, we have a style and other human beings have their ontological styles of appearing. Uh, so there's an encounter and we can only discover something about them in this encounter. 
and and and this discovery is uh, never complete and involves absences and ambiguities. The idea of singularity implies a uniqueness that outrules the conception of a human being as a particular instance of some universal. The emphasis on ambiguity is a rejection of universalization. Meanwhile, Beauvoir makes some universal claims herself, such as no one can be free without others being free. Therefore, an ethics of freedom endorses the moral agent's support of others, freedom from oppression. We need to make a distinction between universalization and an acknowledgement of the value of the universal. The absolute is acknowledged insofar as it means freedom of all. However, the way we get to there must not be a universalizing strategy that treats all subjects as same. But this refusal to see the situation with a signification determined by the absolute should not hide from sight that Beauvoir, for Beauvoir, freedom uh, as an absolute, is, an, is an absolute value. Freedom is her absolute. A signification in which someone is unfree because subject to instrumentalization with a disregard of their freedom is not a description that involves moral vagueness or ambiguity. In what sense then Beauvoir can be correct to see an ambiguity in the oppressed situation? Well, it could be that the oppressed might stand in a relation of complicity with the uh, oppressors. Indeed, in the second sex, she points to women's complicity with their own oppression. The oppressed might be ignorant lacking a reflective awareness that they suffer oppression. Naming a relation of power in the intimate sphere as oppression is an important achievement. Beauvoir affirms the use of violence to intervene in a situation of oppression because oppression is a denial of human transcendence, often on essentialistic grounds. However, such an intervention to negative freedom comes with the acknowledgement of the irreducible ambiguity of moral action. We are finite. We cannot control all the consequences of our acts. We can only be aware of the immediate consequences of our acts. We don't have a negative responsibility for not contributing. We, we have a negative responsibility for not contributing to the situation of oppression, but also we have the positive responsibility to change the situation of oppression. However, there are some constraints accruing from the nature of moral and political action. The agent must not sacrifice and make sure that her action does not close off the possibility of future action. To sacrifice someone, to free others from the situation of oppression would be to close off the possibility of choice and action for the one sacrificed. Okay, maybe my time is up. I can stop here and uh, we can um, discuss some more in Quine. Thank you for your speech. Uh, we would like to take some comments and questions if you have some. Merhabalar hocam. Ee, benim sorum Kierkegaard'ın e, Korku ve Titreme kitabındaki o e, İbrahim ve İshak hikayesinde e, İbrahim'in İshak'ı kurban ettiği sırada ortaya çıkabilecek her türlü eylem, his ve düşüncenin etik bir ayartma olduğu ve e, evrensel bir duyguyla hareket edildiğinde imanın karşısında olabileceğini anladım. Simone de Beauvoir ya da Sartre'ın etik ve özgürlük kavramıyla aralarında nasıl bir köprü kurabiliriz diye bunu merak ediyorum. Oradaki ahlaki belirsizliğin sınırlarını anlamak istiyorum. Okay. Uh, do, do you want me to uh, respond in Turkish or in English? Yeah. I'll translate the question into okay. English and then you can okay. answer in English okay. as well. So... Uh, 
eğer atladığım bir yer olursa lütfen. Um, what was the question? So in the fear and trembling of Kierkegaard, um, there are some comments that um, the in the journey of Abraham and Isaac, where Abraham is is about to sacrifice Isaac, this could be seen as a ethical transgression, and um, our participant is is wondering about um, Professor Dreck's uh, ideas about how this can be related with um, Sartre's and Le Beauvoir's understanding of freedom. Okay. Uh, Türkçe mi, İngilizce mi? Okay. Uh, I, I try to uh, answer the question uh, by uh, first noting that uh, ethics for Kierkegaard uh, in this book, Fear and Trembling, uh, is Kant's ethics. Okay. And Kant's ethics is based on universalizability. So if in uh, sufficiently similar situations it is right for me to do something, then it is right to do that, act in this manner uh, for other people uh, as well. So because act in such a way, the maxim of your action can be a universal law, right? Just like a universal law of nature. So what is right is the act that can be universalized. Now, uh, that's uh, on, on the basis of this understanding of ethics, uh, Kierkegaard contrasts with uh, the ethical uh, standpoint, uh, with the religious standpoint. Because uh, now he's attempting to sacrifice his son uh, on, on the basis of, based on God's command, Right, but seen from a Kantian ethical perspective, he's a criminal because uh, he's violating a duty of justice by sacrificing a rational being. Right, um, so uh, he's in a he, he's caught up in a paradox. Paradox. Uh, he we can condemn him from an ethical. Uh, perspective, of course, from a universalist ethical perspective, from uh, a, a, an ethics of principles, which Beauvoir disagrees here, right? Because in, in Kant, you can abstract from the world. Uh, so, you know, how the world is described, the, the concrete description of facts is are irrelevant, right? You should only look at uh, you, you come up with a maximum of action and see whether it is universal, universalizable or not. That's how you decide. This is how uh, ethical reasoning works uh, in Kant's uh, re reflection on decision making. But uh, ethics in Simone de Beauvoir is contextual. So you shouldn't abstract from the particular situation in which one finds one, oneself. Right? It would be wrong to adopt a Kantian strategy. On the contrary, the right thing to do may be different. You know, in uh, in different contexts, it's more Aristotelian. In fact, right? In Aristotle, you have this attentiveness to the context. Uh, the context has salient features, and the agent must take them into account. I hope I. Uh, that was helpful, and uh, I could shed some light. <laughs> we have two more questions. Um, first on to Emmy. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. It was absolutely wonderful to hear you speaking. Thank you. Um, we, we teach the Beauvoir as part of our master's and doctoral programs in psychotherapy. And we have an increasing number of young students who object to us teaching Sartre and de Beauvoir because of their ethical incursions and their affairs with their students and their behavior, you know, that went against social norms. And they called them out as having been abusive and therefore as suspicious as intellectuals and not to be taught. I would love to hear your answer to that. Uh, yes, 
Bu var, uh, wrote her experiences and uh, uh, she has a book, uh, she came to stay, uh, right? Uh, at the end, uh, he, there, there was a, a relationship entanglement between three people uh, and uh, she begins uh, the affair as um, believing that uh, she can, in fact, live through this experience in an open and um, but but then she finds herself as uh, incapable of tolerating. And at the end, uh, she kills the other women. And, and she wasn't ever happy with the ending of this novel. So uh, all the experiences she uh, lived uh, as a woman uh, in her engagement with Sartre uh, weren't, in fact, uh, very easy for her. Uh, and I, uh, she, she made a commitment. She made a promise. And, and, and she had to sacrifice a lot in order to uh, continue her engagement uh, throughout her, her life. Uh, of course, you know, that's uh, today we have the value of open relationships uh, as well. A lot of young people um, endorse polyamory, for example, right? Not being committed to one person. And uh, so the relationship uh, can be open to other people. But of course, that makes... Uh, the entanglement really complicated and uh, it will be very difficult. I mean, it's a challenge, in fact, to uh, you know, seriously respect and love other people and, um, you know, like uh, embrace this plurality in your life without being unjust to anybody, unethical to anybody. Now, I think the uh, criticisms to Beauvoir uh, may have to do with the instru instrumentalization of other women, right? Other women, maybe she, there's a, uh, also uh, the... And, uh, and you can get the sense of uh, she, uh, in, in open relationships, when two people strongly commit to another, the third person, uh, may end up being inevitably instrumental. It's the last, uh, you know, so it is as if the third is uh, less important. And of course, you know, uh, in fact, a lot of other people uh, have had the same experience. like a lot of people are failing uh, and uh, she's critical of herself as well. I don't think she's defending herself, uh, but uh, we live in a cancel culture uh, today and, and on uh, race or, or because they fail to acknowledge slave trade uh, so uh, we can cancel a lot of people, uh, but it is important to Heidegger, for example, Heidegger affair, because uh, he held his uh, Nazi card until the end of his life. Uh, but sh should we continue to uh, read Heidegger? Recently, Black Notebooks, right? Uh, and, and she had this anti-Semitic comments uh, but I think uh, learning to leave these people with their uh, wrongs and with their failures is mind opening. And like canceling them and not reading them makes us lose a lot. Um, we have one more question, but I know that it's break time, but it's a very valuable discussion. So if you want, if you need to take a break, please go ahead. But our last question over to you, Laura. Oh. 
Oh, yes, you stressed the, her concern for the freedom of others and as a way also of preventing a absolutism, mm -hmm. an absolute. Now, is her, I mean, I would see her silence over Soviet dissidents in gulags so as not to give the bourgeois the satisfaction of hearing it, hearing about it, a contradiction of that because it's putting absolutism before uh before the freedom of others, and I was wondering what you made of that. If in the ethics of ambiguity, uh, he is taking uh, a distance to, uh, you know, like the communist uh, seriosity, like seriousness, seriousness, right? Uh, so she's against systems and uh, kind of totalizing perspectives. Uh, and also, uh, although may, that the context may not be very clear, uh, that can be a response to. I mean, sometimes silence is meaningful. You know, it's like the philosophical points she's making is that she's deeply perturbed or disturbed uh, by uh, the revelations of the Soviet mm. regime. And and and uh, there are some, uh, of course, uh, ideas uh, concerning the freedom of all. But if, in order to achieve this goal for a free world, we have to sacrifice or or like instrumentalize, manipulate uh, people's freedom, that's something unacceptable to her. And that's uh, what her that's argument the is. Is that the ambiguity? Yes. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I yes. think uh, she's critical of the French left. Yes, and, and she said, on ne voulait pas donner uh, uh, satisfaction aux bourgeois. Oui, oui. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Drake. Thank you for joining us today. I think it's very important for us existential therapists, you know, in our quest to make all this philosophical wisdom into something practical, we also need to touch base with the philosophy itself. So um, thank you so much. That was very, very important for us. Thank you.